Hey, HTDA hey, and welcome back to this Dyson Sphere Masterclass. This time we are going to be building some of the most fun builds I think you can make in this game. And it's also one of the most important transitions in this game because we're going to be producing green science. And as the dark fog is doing feeble attempts in destroying my shields, which they're definitely not successful at at all, because as you can see the shields are holding just fine. I would like to thank Will Davis, Xian M, Patat Orlog, Fans Force Me, Elias Kota, my name is Paul39, and my boss, all becoming member of the channel and supporting me in that way. So that's amazing, guys. Thank you very much. Not only do you get early access to all my content by becoming a member, but you will also get your own star system in this universe, which will actually show up once we start traveling between the stars. We will have several pretty large builds in this episode and they're some of my favorite builds actually in the entire game. But before we get to that, I just want to mention that you should keep an eye on your supply lines. So make sure you're mining enough to keep all your builds that you currently have up and running actually supplied with resources. Make sure you keep defending your planets and also keep in mind that when you place these planetary shield generators, they will take a lot of power. So make sure that you keep building your power supply either just because you have a lot of destroyed bases but you can do the same thing with solar panels or whatever you want in order to make sure you keep power. If you have a lava planet like I have over here you might even place some geothermal stations to keep your power up and running. Whatever you do just make sure you don't run low on power. Making sure you have enough resources also extends to your gas giant, so the planet next to your starting planet, where you can place these orbital collectors to collect hydrogen and a secondary resource from this planet non-stop, all the time, infinitely as well. Uh, as you can see, you can place these orbital collectors down uh, around the equator, and it's very easy to build them now since the last update, because you can just left-click on a building to build it yourself, which is a lot faster than having your drones do it for you. It used to be one of the most tedious things in the game and it's now a lot faster as you can see. Now if you're on my seat you will see that we're actually producing fire ice on this gas giant as well. Which is super convenient but I'm actually not going to use it just yet. Because I can be sure that if you're on a different playthrough you have access to that as well. Because it's a rare resource. Now before we get to the new builds, I'd like to do a special call out to Steve Bonds. Thank you for double checking all my blueprints and catching those tiny little mistakes that are in there that might not make them work optimally. Uh, which includes the missile blueprint from the last episode where he pointed out that there were two smelters for copper missing. That was actually a mistake in my own calculator, so that's a pretty important thing to find. So again, thank you for that. Um, so I added in these two smelters over here. I rearranged the belts a little bit to make that work. And if you downloaded the missile blueprint from the last episode and you used it yourself, you might want to re-download it and make sure it looks like exactly this. Because otherwise it will not be producing two missiles per second, it will only be producing 1.5 per second. Which is still a lot, but eh, just adding two smelters gets you a lot more bang for your buck. And as you can see it's working pretty well because I'm now sitting on 10,000 missiles so the dark fog has no chance. Okay, so first new blueprint is not a very special blueprint. It's just an addition to the mall. We're going to be making nanotubes in our mall. And this is a bit of cheating because usually I make a dedicated build for this. But we're not going to be producing nanotubes for very long like this. This is just to make sure we can actually make some of these particle colliders. Because in order to make particle colliders... Uh, let me show you the recipe. We are going to need frame material. And in order to make frame material, we are going to need nanotubes. You guessed it. So, um, all that we need for nanotubes are some graphene and some titanium, which we have plenty of. So, you can see this already coming in. We're going to make some, and this is going to be exported to a box over here. Next up on the list is another very tiny build in order to make some frame materials so we can get those particle colliders up and running. This is the only thing that you're going to need them for for a very long time, so you only need a tiny middle, a little amount of production. Um, we're going to be making a lot more frame material later on, but for now this will do. Okay, so let's look at some recipes before we actually get into it so you understand why we're going to be building the builds for green science rather than just making the warpers from lenses because there's actually two ways to make those warpers. Now as you can see you get one warper for one lens but you get eight warpers for one green science. Now green science itself is made from one lens as well as one of these quantum chips. So you actually get two science 
for one lens and the two signs then translates into a total of 16 warpers so that one lens actually not doesn't translate into one warper but 16 warpers so it's extremely more efficient to make your warpers from green signs than making it straight up from lenses so this is why we're going to take that one additional step to get our green signs going and we just siphon off a tiny little bit of that green science and we're going to have all the warpers that we're going to need for a very very long time now as you can see i'm going to make these builds on our secondary planet because we have a lot of space to build there and these builds are anything but small um, I'm actually going to start out with the quantum chips build and we're going to need four smelters making iron, six smelters making copper and then we're going to need, how many are these? Yes, 16 smelters making silicon and that's all, all going to be needed to make one quantum chip per second and if that sounds like not a lot, well it actually isn't because we're going to need a lot of quantum chips for a lot of different things it's actually one of the most used items in the entire game um, but we're going to start somewhere, so we're going to start out small because as you will see, this build is already going to be pretty large, even if we're just trying to produce one per second. This build is going to feel very familiar because we're going to be adding two assemblers making circuit boards and then eight assemblers making the crystalline components. And then we can fit in nicely the six processor assemblers that we need over here. So we have a nice square looking thing. I really like marking up all these belts so you know what goes where. Because honestly things are kind of like flipping around, turning around, flipping around each other. Uh, it can get really confusing so I hope this makes it easier for you to follow along. Then we actually have quite a few of the parts that we need for the uh, quantum processors already. At least half of them because that's the processors. However, the other half, the plane filters, which is a new item that we haven't made before yet, is going to require a lot more work. First of all, because the recipe is extremely slow for the plane filter, so we need six assemblers making the one per second quantum chips. But then we need 24 of these assemblers to make the actual plane filters. Now the plane filters itself actually require two new resources as well. We need to start making titanium glass, which is actually pretty straightforward. And then we're going to be making the large arc nemesis of the early endgame, which is the Casimir Crystal. We are going to need eight of these assemblers making the Casimir Crystal. And if you're wondering what's the problem with this, well, first of all, it needs quite a bit of an annoying resource. So we need graphene as well as the titanium crystals. But we also need a ton of hydrogen. So you need 12 hydrogen to make a single Casimir Crystal. And up until this point, you were probably drowning in hydrogen because, well, we didn't really have anything to use it on. Well, don't worry, these Casimir crystals will take care of that really, really fast. Another annoying item to make, at least in this part of the game, is the titanium crystal because you need the organic crystals for that, which needs a lot of other stuff again. So, the way I'm going to set up these builds is actually in a way that will allow you tra to transition from where you are now without access to the other systems just yet to a different version of this exact same build where we're actually going to be using all the rare resources that you have in the game because for example organic crystals can actually directly be mined on some planets just not the planets in your starting system so rather than making a build that completely depends on making these things themselves which i am going to do initially i'm going to make it sure that you can actually cut these out later on However, we're not quite there yet because we will also need quite a bit of titanium to go on. So we need 20 smelters making titanium. As you can see, I have two belts on the outside to supply. And then this single belt in the middle will be sufficient to transport a part of that titanium to the titanium crystal production. And then this other belt is going to go along because we also need to make titanium glass. Which is where these 10 assemblers making quantum chips come in. Now, by the way, we will also be able to use these quantum chips to actually upgrade to Mark III assemblers as well. Which is going to have an impact on these builds as well. And again, it's set up in such a way you can easily adjust this build later on. In order to make the glass, we will not only need titanium and uh, glass itself, but we also need some water. So I have water coming in from over here. You'll see why in a moment. And we have 8 of these smelters making glass. Then you might have noticed that I just skipped the actual production of the organic crystal and graphene because we are going to make, be making that in this part of the build. And this part of the build you can actually completely delete later on. But for now we're going to have to make it the old fashioned way. So that means we need 20 smelters making graphite. 
Then remember that we also need to make um, plastic in order to make organic crystal, which means we're going to need an amazing uh, 12 of these chemical labs in order to make plastic and another 12 to make the organic crystal. Then we need six more chemical labs making graphene and three more making the assets that we need to make the graphene. As you can see, I've put the belts in such positions that we can usually benefit from both sides from making something. For example, the uh, graphene over here, uh, is a, a graphite, I mean, is going to be used by both the plastic as well as the graphene. The acid is using the water as well as the uh, oil over here and so on. So there's a lot of things being efficient in terms of belts. But other than that, not too much effort going into making this look good because, again, this is very much temporary. And then, uh, last but not least, we need 26 of these refineries to actually make the oil that we need for this build. So, in case you're wondering why I'm a huge fan of these rare resources, the rare resources are going to be replacing all of this just with a very simple setup. And then, all we need to do is add in a lot of these sorters and power towers in order to power everything up, add in some ILSs to request the different materials that we need. Um, this is actually going to be changing a little bit as well in the final version of this build, but for now this is going to work just fine. We are importing raw oil, we're also exporting the hydrogen that we are making as a byproduct. So that is going to go straight into this part of the build, where it's also going to be recycled as far as we can for the Casimir crystals that we're also making here. All in all, a pretty nice looking build, even though we are not really paying much attention to this half of it. And it's a pretty large build as well. So you're going to need to be unlocking the purple science blueprint. Basically, that means that you can make infinitely large blueprints in order to use this yourself. Now we're getting to the Graviton Lens. And the Graviton Lens itself is typically an item that a lot of people struggle with because suddenly you need to start making a lot of new materials. One of which is Strange Matter, which is honestly something that we are making from things that we've already been making. But because Deuterium is actually added to the mix as well, it can be really complicated for at least new players to figure out how do I actually make all of this? So the trick here is to recognize that a lot of the base materials that you need for that are actually builds that we've already been making before. However, we need to start making especially the uh, particle containers in a large, much larger amount than we've been making it before. So we are going to be needing 24 smelters making magnets. We're going to need 12 of them making copper and we're going to need 26, I believe this is. Uh, smelters making iron. So I added in the two lost smelters over here. It kind of sticks out. It's a little bit annoying me, but it's by far, I think, the cleanest way to lay this out. Then the next section is going to be dedicated to getting all the base resources we need in order to make the motors, which means we need some more magnetic coils, which is where all the magnets are going to come in. We are going to need quite a lot of gears as well, and we need a total of eight assemblers making each of those items. Then we're bringing in all the remaining iron on the belt over here. So we actually have surplus iron. We have the gears, the coils, and the surplus copper as well. Then we're going to need 16 assemblers making the actual motors, which is a lot of them. But uh, make sure that you keep one of the input belts on the outside, because remember three items means that you can't just have all the three input belts in between, because you won't be able to reach them with the sorters. Now, we're done with the iron for now. Well, actually, no, we're not. We still need the iron for some of the layer things that we need. So the iron is going to be used in a lot of places. The motors are going to go on, all on this belt over here. And then we also still need the magnetic coils because we also need to make turbines. You do got to love the symmetry of this entire build because once again, we need eight assemblers making turbines. So this is where the uh, motors come in and the magnetic coils. Then we're done with both of those items, but we're actually going to be bringing in the surplus copper now because the copper goes into the particle container and then the turbines and the copper along with graphene, which we haven't produced just yet. So this is coming to go in from the bottom is going to be used in order to make the particle containers. Then bringing in the remaining bit of iron that we have left along with some deuterium that is going to come in from the side over here and bringing in a total of eight of these particle colliders that you've even been building from the start of this episode, um, we are now able to make strange matter. And the strange matter is going to come in this belt on the top, flipping around over here, going down the bottom over here. 
which then loops in very tightly to this set of six assemblers making the actual lenses. Now, in order to make lenses, we also need that diamond that I was just mentioning. We also need the graphene. In other words, we need a lot of stuff that we can make from rare resources. So again, I made sure to leave them on the side. Now, very similar to the actual build that we just did before for the quantum chips, we need again 20 of these uh, smelters making graphite. Uh, we're going to use that slightly different in this case, though, because we need about half of that in order to make these eight smelters here making diamonds. The remaining bit is going to go into the graphene production along with the acid production over here. And as you can see, we need a lot less of these refineries in order to power all of this or supply all of this, I should say. Uh, mostly because we're not making organic crystals and plastic unlike in the previous build. But we're still using these six chemical labs for the graphene and three of them making acid. Now you can hook all of this up to power with sorters and things like that and you will have a nice mostly functional build however there's going to be one problem you don't actually have any strange matter being produced because we don't yet have the deuterium which is going to come in from this ILS over here. So let's go and fix that shall we because that's again one of my favorite builds in this game. Now of course if you have a gas giant that actually produces deuterium it might have already been working. However, there's another way to make deuterium and that is by, well, there's actually two other ways to make deuterium. First of all, you can make it in the particle collider, which is a very power hungry way of doing it. It's a pretty efficient way of doing it, but still very power hungry. The more fun way and more cheap way to do this is the fractionator. This is basically a building where you have a belt going through that translates hydrogen into deuterium just by having it go through the building. Now this is actually I think one of the best looking buildings in the game and I don't know it's something that appeals to me but um, the, way, the way it works you have the hydrogen coming in from one side and out on the other and then the front port over here this is where the deuterium comes out so we have um, two mirrored buildings next to basically opposite each other next to each other whatever you want to call it and then we just have a big row of about 15 of these things on one side 15 on the other. And then we might as well duplicate that on the other side as well. The nice thing about this long stretched build is that you can build it closer to the poles as well. So it doesn't interfere with some of your larger builds that you want to be building near to the equator. Now, a lot of people get very much carried away by optimizing this particular fractionator build. But I can't blame him. It's a lot of fun to do that. Uh, but even with this completely unoptimized build, uh, build I just have the belt running all the way around without any interference whatsoever you can already see this is producing the deuterium at a pretty decent speed so you don't really need to optimize this if you don't want to however of course we do want to do so now in one of my previous builds i actually did this with the automatic piler so combining multiple belts stacking these things up because if you stack up your hydrogen on the belt this actually multiplies the output of the deuterium as well it basically is just equivalent to if you get more hydrogen passing through the building, you will have a higher output as well. So you want to stack this up as high as you can. Now, thanks to the sorter piler that we now have access to, you don't actually need to use the automatic piler, the, the one over here anymore, which is really inconvenient because it takes a lot of space. Now, you can just have this looping sorter on this belt like here. Initially, this will only stack twice or three times depending on how much you upgraded it just yet but the further you get in your technology tree the more efficient this will get and I actually have two of them over here just to restack the stacks a little bit but this is just to get it a lot more optimized because again we're, we're actually moving a lot more hydrogen through the system this way and this second build is actually looping in here at the front just to make sure we get as much hydrogen in at the front and then the second one is flipping all the way around and is coming here from the side. Now it's important that this secondary belt comes in from the side because you don't want to interrupt the flow of the belt that goes straight through. So for example, if I were to connect this like this, what happens is this belt gets priority, so this belt completely stops, which means half of these fractionators are no longer working, which again is why you want to connect it like this, so that doesn't happen. Um, same thing happens on the other side and you can take this a lot further if you want to. I'm not going to do this because we already have all the deuterium we're going to need just from this single build. Keep in mind that we just built an equivalent uh, size factory that's actually larger than um, I think all of the things we did in the first four episodes combined. So uh, on top of that 
These are upgraded versions of buildings that actually consume more power. And the particle colliders um, use 12 megawatts of power each. So this is going to have a huge impact on your power drain on your secondary planet if you're building it there. But whatever planet you're building, are building it on will require a lot of power. So make sure that you build the rings of power or whatever you want. But keep your power up and running because along with these shields you're going to need a lot of that. This might also mean that if you're building some of these larger builds on a different planet than your starting planet, that this planet might now be the one that is actually consuming the most energy, which means this will be the planet where all the fleets are going to be aimed at. It doesn't always happen like that. It's a little bit fickle every now and then when you have two planets with a lot of production. Just keep in mind that it's not necessarily the case that all the fleets will still be going to your main planet. So make sure this one is properly defended as well. Great news everyone, we are now capable of producing green signs, which basically means you've won the game. Uh, well, not technically, but honestly, once you have green signs, it's going to become very hard to actually lose the game because you cannot run out of resources anymore. Now, I did change a few things in this um, science hub layout. Not the layout itself actually, but mostly the production locations of the different colors of science. I flipped a couple of them around. So if you've been using the blueprint before, the green science wasn't actually in there, but I moved the yellow science from this location, I believe, to the, to the smaller location over here because it's an easier recipe to make. And I made sure that the most complicated recipes being the purple and the green science are now on the places with the most matrix labs. Just makes sense. Another new addition to the blueprint are these six assemblers over here making warpers. I have a splitter to make sure that I'm not using all my green signs in here. But as you can see, we are producing more green signs than these six can handle anyway. But still, we're producing a pretty decent amount of space warpers. Make sure you grab some for yourself. You don't ever want to find yourself without space warpers on the other side of the galaxy. And that's very inconvenient. Um, and as you can see, this is right now being completely drained. But there is actually a huge amount of warpers coming in. The reason this is going to be drained is because a lot of my previous blueprints have already been set up to request warpers because I was anticipating the fact that we're going to be making these. In general, there are very few cases I can think of where you would ever want to request more than 100 uh, space warpers in your ILS. So this is the minimum amount that you can request simply because, well, it's going to take a long time for 100 vessels to fly up and down from this ILS so by that time um, you will be ha you have plenty of time to replenish them basically so you don't want to have thousands of these warpers sitting around in each of your ILSs. Uh, you can go through your base if you want at this point to uh, find all the ILSs where you're not yet requesting warpers because we added in the ILS later before we actually researched the warpers themselves uh, and you can just uh, add them in from this point set them to 100 requirements ask for them locally or remotely and voila, this build will now continue to work until the end of the game.